He's one of the most powerful and flamboyant investors in the Middle East, one who rarely gives interviews, but we caught up with him on a recent visit to Toronto. Saudi Prince Al Walid bin Talal has been called the Warren Buffett of the Middle East. He owns sizable stakes in companies such as Citigroup, News Corp and Four Seasons Hotels. And as CEO and 95% owner of Kingdom Holding Company, was an early investor in Twitter, some 300 million invested in the social media giant. Well connected at home, including a close bond to his cousin, the King of Saudi Arabia, and educated abroad, Prince Al Walid's power straddles east and west and he's earned a reputation as an advocate for reform in the Middle East. He's also earned a reputation for a keen interest in his own net worth, taking on Forbes magazine for understating his wealth and ranking on its list of richest people. But whatever his net worth, his influence is strong, with business associates who range from former Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak and former Libyan ruler Muammar Gaddafi to Bill Gates and Rupert Murdoch. When we spoke, I asked if reform is moving more slowly than he'd like in Saudi Arabia. King Abdullah is very much a reformer, no doubt about that. But clearly, uh, I believe that uh, uh, the reform process has to be accelerated uh, quite a bit more to really to be in, in, uh, in parallel path with uh, what's happening in the whole world. Uh, so yes, uh, I believe that we are on the right track in Saudi Arabia, uh, but the process and the, uh, has to be expedited and has to be accelerated a lot faster to really to, uh, to for example, incorporate the ladies in the, in the, in the, in the workforce, in the community, in, in a more uh, uh, cohesive manner. In fact, countries that have sort of flirted with reform, uh, and we've seen, I guess Egypt is probably the best example, have seen a kind of a retrenchment. Do you worry about uh, a rise of radical Islam, a rise of kind of fanaticism in the countries in your neighborhood? Look, uh, fa fanaticism and, and radical Islam is, is available. Right? We, can, we can see it and witness that you know, from, from Indonesia, going to Pakistan, Afghanistan, to Iraq, to our region, even to North Africa. So really, we see that uh, e even London has some uh, radical uh, Islam. Uh, our job and duty really is to really uh, to to to, uh, to encourage moderate Muslims to come out publicly and and and, and uh, advocate their cause, and our our objective really is to try not to have those minority of our region kidnap or hijack our region and and be and have us all stigmatized by this wrong uh, impression. Frankly speaking, one of the difficulties you could argue is uh, while Saudi Arabia has been a strong and good ally to the United States. It's a complicated relationship because of the, your role in the region, the country's role in the region. Is the United States making it difficult to be pro-American these days? Well, I, I think the United States is making it difficult for its friends to be uh, uh, as the, uh, its allies because you see, uh, uh, not only Saudi Arabia has uh, issues with the foreign policy of the United States. We see in Europe, for example, Mrs. Merkel is not very happy with what's going on by uh, tapping her phone, uh, her, uh, her phone, her phone. We see uh, the president of Brazil canceling her visit, official visit to the United States. Uh, so really, uh, these are three countries that already uh, are, are upset with the policy of the United States. And I only give you some examples. So I think it's about time for the United States to have a cohesive, a coherent, and, and a very well-defined policy towards the whole world. Look, the United States is down but not out, and they will lead the world for a long time to come. So it's very important to have a strategy and a vision and objective whereby the whole world will follow the United States. But unfortunately right now, with what's happening in the United States internally, with the budget deficit situation, with the, with the debt issue, with the Obamacare, uh, with the poverty level, which now is around 15%, which is you know, uh, around 49 million people in the United States are uh, below poverty level. So all these things really you know, are impacting the, the image and the, uh, the presence of the United States uh, internationally. And there's a vacuum right now because there's a lot of thought that China is going to come, India is going to come. They're way behind. China and India, way behind. They are decades, not years, behind the United States in taking that role. So the United States have to really, you know, get it act, its, its act in order. Are you supportive of China? Do you invest there? Do you, uh, are you friendly with, uh, with the senior officials there? Oh, definitely. We, we have very good relation with China. We invest in Bank of China, went public. We, uh, our hotel brands, Four Seasons, Fairmont, they are going to have around 30 hotels in the next two, three years there. We are invested in. We are investor in the uh, second biggest internet company in China called 360. 
So yes, we have a lot of uh, strong presence there. You know, Citibank is there, Newscope is there. So we are there through many angles, through uh, directly and indirectly, in the banking industry, real estate, uh, hotels, and technology. In the shifting kind of global powers, one of the things that may change in your region is uh, oil. Your country is still very dependent on oil. Uh, America will become a, a net exporter of oil before too long, we're told. How will that change the dynamic, and is Saudi Arabia prepared for it? Uh, this is a very good question because uh, I'm being very vocal and, and not public uh, with my views on that subject, whereby uh, Saudi Arabia is still is 92%, its budget depends on oil. Uh, and even if the price of oil is still going to be maintained at where it is right now, even without the shale oil being uh, found and produced, there's no country that can, should be dependent on oil that much. Having said that, now with the shale oil production increasing, uh, with the United States being very much um, oil dependent and also being on, on the verge of being uh, oil, net, net oil exporter, no doubt that the dynamics of the relationship between Saudi Arabia is at risk of, 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 of being changed. So it's very important for us, Saudi Arabia, to lessen our reliance on oil, number one. And number two is also to, to, to have our relation improve with the United States further, because right now there's a lot of tension at the political level, let alone the economic level, as I, I answered the, the previous question. What is the thing you worry most about in the world in terms of uh, your investments, but also your country, your family? Does something worry you more than anything else? Well, it's not the matter of worry or concern. It is, uh, you know, uh, all investors, all businessmen, and everybody would like to get stability, tranquility, and, uh, you know, peace to prevail in the whole world. Now, inevitably, that this, this may not be the case. So our job and duty is really to minimize an imp uh, the impact of any uh, 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 act of terrorism, any of uh, any uh, natural problem that may happen, like it happened in the Philippines right now. So the world is, is very dynamic, and uh, but we, we only hope that that such natural uh, disasters or such um, uh, uh, terrorist acts do not really uh, uh, impact the tranquility and the civility of, of, of the world we're living in. Billionaire Saudi investor Prince Alwaleed bin Talal began his business career in 1979 upon graduating from Silicon Valley's Menlo College. He calls himself a self-made man who started with a loan of just $30,000 from his dad, a senior member of the Saudi royal family. In the second part of my interview with His Royal Highness, I began by asking him to describe his investment style. Yeah, uh, you know, Kingdom Holding is a Saudi-based company. And uh, it's very diversified, and it's involved in uh, uh, at least 13 uh, industries uh, that encompasses uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Middle East, and the world. Uh, our our uh, investment philosophy is uh, to invest in companies uh, that uh, are unique in their fields. Uh, the entry barrier is is, is very high uh, for other competitors to get into and uh, to enter at a time where uh, uh, the uh, return investment in IRR uh, is, 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 uh, is going to be beneficial to our shareholders. You have, as you say, diversified investments. One of your most famous and successful was an early investment uh, in Citibank, Citigroup, um, an investment that, of course, you stayed with faithfully. I, I, want, I wonder about your perspective on what happened to that bank but in the context of the credit crisis, were you shocked that it was allowed to happen, that, that the management of that bank and others let that happen? Well, you know, you're talking about the crisis of 2008, obviously. Uh, clearly, the, uh, at that time, uh, the regulations were, were very loose. And clearly, uh, Citigroup was one of the main banks that was impacted negatively. And uh, certain banks went bankrupt also, as you know. Uh, but having said that, Clearly, the, uh, after its capitalization, uh, Citigroup is very much on track right now, really, to, uh, to benefit its shareholders. And if you analyze in depth the, the last two quarters of uh, Citibank's results, they were really uh, uh, very good, especially the quarter before this quarter, whereby uh, they, they beat the uh, street estimates. And uh, uh, the market looked, reacted very favorably to, to, to that share price. And as a result of that, uh, it, was, uh, 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 it was upgraded to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, several notches by, by many of the rating agencies. 
Do you, are you a believer in America's prospects today, that it has solved the issues that created the credit crisis, that its economy will recover strongly? Are you investing there strongly now? Well, you know, uh, the, uh, the banks uh, are pretty well capitalized. You know, all the big banks, you know, the, the Wells Fargo's of the world and the J.P. Morgan's, the Citigroup's and the Bank of America's. These are the four main banks, the remaining four banks, if I can use this term, in the United States. But still, uh, on the regulatory side, there is still very, uh, very much uncertainty. Uh, you've seen that the Volcker rule has been going on for four years now without any uh, conclusive results. The Basel um, rules also has not been finalized completely. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there are still um, a lot of uh, uh, uncertainties. So I think it's important for the, the, the regulators to get the, their house in order and to begin uh, putting those rules in action so the banks know exactly which direction to move because right now many of their investment um, ideas or concepts are not being implemented or executed because of worry uh, that certain uh, new banking rules that may come may impact their uh, capital ratios, which may impact them negatively. Having said that, I believe that the banks are a step ahead now of the regulators by being ultra-conservative in their approach. On the other hand, we hear about scandal after scandal, LIBOR, uh, price fixing in various parts of the market. You are obviously pro-capitalism, uh, but does it unnerve you? Does it make you feel as though we're not quite getting, the regulators aren't quite getting it right because there seems to be so much wrongdoing going on? You know, no doubt that the laissez-faire approach of capitalism that prevailed in the decade or two decades before the market crisis in the banking industry 2008 uh, really has gone completely because uh, uh, the regulators were too loose, the banks uh, became too greedy, and they very much became oriented toward uh, the benefits of, uh, of its directors and management rather than of shareholders. So uh, all these, uh, I, hope the, uh, I, I can only say that I hope these lessons have been learned by the banks uh, and by the regulators and to get their house in order. So, uh, but from my interaction with many of these bankers, I believe that they learned it the hard way, yes. And all the scandals you see right now are the residual of uh, those excesses that took place in the uh, 1990s, late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh. Uh, you are diversified, as you say. Is there a sector that you're particularly interested in now that you're looking at that you may not be in yet, but that you're interested in? No, really. You know, we have uh, 13 industries that we, we, we invest in, and uh, they all go parallel, frankly speaking. We all try to nurture them and to grow them. Uh, like when, I, for example, I came now to Toronto here, I visited the Four Seasons, which we own jointly with Bill Gates, and we visit also the Fairmont brand, which you jointly own with our Qatari partners, the Qatari government. And now we have this Toronto hotel here, the Four Seasons. So no, uh, you know, all our investments go parallel, and we try to nurture and to grow uh, all those investments parallel. Clearly, uh, also parallel to that, we also look at new opportunities, such as the latest Twitter investment, which we invested in some time ago and it just went public right now. Um, but there are other investments very much uh, uh, scattered globally. And you're reported to have made uh, a great deal on that Twitter investment. I think 600 million is the number that I've seen. Uh, I've also seen reports, as I'm sure you have, that, uh, that you sometimes inflate the value of Kingdom Holdings to make it look more, uh, more successful than it is, uh, sometimes to get on certain lists or rankings. Uh, what, what do you, how do you respond to those no, kinds I of things? I think now you are referring to the Forbes situation. Yes, I am. This for sure, this all in window heresy and uh, untruthful facts is wrong. You know, Saudi Arabia is a very much regulated uh, country. Uh, and uh, our stock market now is very much open like United States and Canada and Europe. And uh, all this talk from Forbes really is, 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 is not, uh, is baseless at all and it's not correct and uh, you know uh, the stock market in Saudi Arabia is very much re regulated like like in Canada and United States. So it would be impossible to do what they're it's suggesting? It's not impossible, it's not, it's not on the, I mean for, for a company like us, uh, this is not, the, it's not even on the, our radar screen to think of, of such uh, things that, uh, or such allegations that were uh, uh, said by, 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 by Forbes. Does it matter to you where you fall on a list of global billionaires? This is really very academic, frankly speaking, and really I mean uh, what I care about is really to have create value to my shareholders and clearly I'm one of these shareholders and I push very hard really to, uh, to create value for our shareholders and uh, that are, most of them are Saudi based right now. I know really frankly speaking where you fit in the rank is really, it's, it's very academic really.